Hi there, welcome to the Accidental Pop Star here on YouTube. My name is Ali Begg. I'm a former sports broadcaster. I was an author and I was also a member of 1990s boy band Bad Boys Inc. We were signed to AM Records between the years 1992 and 1995, and we had relative chart success across the world before we went our separate ways in the spring of 95. My experience and my path and what was a fleeting brush with fame certainly changed the type of person that I was and the type of person that I actually strive to be. So what's the idea behind this channel? The thinking is to interview pop stars, both past and present, about their own experiences and their own path and see if we can find common ground. Is having a number one hit and being on the front cover of Smash Hits magazine everything that it's cracked up to be? For this episode, I'm delighted to welcome to the accidental pop star, D Reams frontman, Pete Connor. We are going back to the 1990s, a period I know very well. D Ream had a huge global hit with Things Can Only Get Better. Eight top 40 hits soon followed before exhaustion set in. Pete is and was one of the nicest guys that I met during my time with Bad Boys Inc. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome him to the Accidental Pop Star. Peter, it's lovely to see you. It, my goodness, it's been an awful long time since we last saw each other in the flesh. So I'm absolutely delighted to jump on with you today. So thank you for taking the time. Let's oh, go good. right back to the beginning. Can you remember the time when music really started to play an influence on your life? Um, the honest answer is no, <laughs> only because, <laughs> only because I just, I can't separate that process. I, I don't remember being aware of it other than, um, my dad had one of those, um, really old console. Um, if you can imagine it was like a long piece of furniture, it didn't look like a high fi or anything. It was just a big piece of wood with some grills either side. I don't know what they call them. And it had a, a, a turntable in there and a radio. Yeah. And a place to store your, your, your records. Yeah, yeah. And I, w I was mad for the Beach Boys, uh, uh, Go Granny Go. Yeah. <laughs> so I used to get a stool and go and put this thing on. The first thing I learned today, I must have been about three. And I was putting this thing on. I must have worn it out, right? <laughs> it was just one of those things. And I remember, too, doing that thing that, um, uh, you know, most musicians do if you're obsessed. I saw, I would see Elvis on the TV or, and I went, I went and got a candlestick and I had a little toy guitar and I'd stand at the hearth, the fireplace and put this kit. And this became like my party piece. You know, I was, I was tarted around to all these, these family events and uh, Pete's going to, you know, he's going to sing like he's Elvis, you know? But, yeah. <laughs> well, just, I can't remember the separation. That's the honest answer. Yeah. Okay. See, as a youngster, <laughs> how did you define fame? And did it influence what was your eventual path into the music industry? Ooh. Um, well, like, like everyone else, I was, I was watching all this. I wasn't really into glam rock as a kid, um, mm -hmm. but I did I did like the basic rollers, um, but they weren't, I suppose, glam rock. Uh, only so far as my mum wouldn't buy me the trousers, which is very annoying. But I, I made up for it later on with the check pants, right? Um, <laughs> but the, no, funny, because... Um, yeah, I just, I didn't think of fame. I had really no concept of it. It was just that, you know, you'd sit and watch these things with your family and we would watch Shirley Bassey or we'd see Cliff Richards or any of that kind of thing. And, um, and I, I just enjoy it with my family. My first taste for music in so far as being aware of something that I was compelled to love was hearing uh, Bohemian Rhapsody on the chart rundown. Yeah, yeah. Every week for seven weeks, you know, I must have been, I must have been 10 I was born in 66, so that must have been mid-70s. And uh, I was obsessed by this. And I just, but don't forget, it's the time when we couldn't record it. And I wouldn't even have the sense that a 10-year-old to ask my dad to go and buy it for me. So I had to be at the radiogram every Sunday for the chart rundown. So that's mm -hmm. that's really the first thing I absolutely loved. And then after that, it was just a cascade of other acts like uh, The Police and Simple Minds and Eurythmics as I became more and more aware of what was going on around me. And as a teenager... Mm -hmm. I was learning to play guitar from the age of 10. So I was already listening to people my dad listened to, which was Chet Atkins and Johnny Cash. But in addition to that, I was finding out about 
all the other acts that I really liked that was copying their stuff, like Joe Jackson, different for girls. I learned that in guitar. I learned um, a lot of Paul Simon Garfunkel tunes on guitar. And that really sort of informed my playing and that, that, that led on to, you know, better and brighter things. So you mentioned you, you mentioned your parents there. I, I was just wondering, mm. did they have any sort of influence over you? And did they, you know, once you sort of decided that this was your path, did they encourage you, yeah. or were they like, no, you need to go and get a normal job? Oh, uh, yeah, you always got the. Uh, that's not a proper job. That was yeah. that was a given. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what? What do you? What my grandmother said. Why would you want to be a musician? Because there, there's two to every penny in Derry right two to the penny they would say and I was like I didn't think about that I just wanted to do it because I'd, I'd not learned from them because none of the people in my family I was adopted you see so none oh, of the people yeah. in my family were, were musicians so it's kind of like a handicap in its own way because rather than growing up around musicians you're just going around people who tell you don't play the guitar because you're never meant to anything so you know despite that I got on with it and um uh yeah I, I suppose the only thing they did do as my adopted parents was they, they bought me my first guitar and it was a proper guitar and a proper amplifier. So I got myself a, a Fender Mustang and a Fender Twin Reverb. And I played the hell out of that for four or five years before I got into my first band at 15. Mm. So, so, you know, I, I don't know. It's a mixture of things, really. But did they influence me insofar as my dad had a massive Johnny Cash collection? He was into like Luden Wainwright, Tommy Wynette, you know, all of those kind of classical um country artists and there's a big country thing in here in ireland but because i became a teenager i got into the indie scene here because we we were into the undertones and uh, moon dogs and all the kind of bands yeah. that we thought were like they, they weren't that far from us so mm. it was a matter of learning your instrument while being in the band and that was we just called it we're going to i'm having practice i didn't have a rehearsal we just to practice together so we became good as musicians together we didn't we weren't virtuosos who got together we just became a unit together. Okay. Yeah, that was my tones. first band. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Fairly yeah. Sharky. Just love him. Love yeah. the Undertones. I know. Um, uh, can you, so let's fast forward a few more years. Can you explain the process of signing your record deal? Am I correct in saying it was Magnet Records? Yeah, that's right. Magnet yeah. subsidiary of Warner's. But um, yeah, as musicians, you're always kind of got your eye on the prize, really, because if you're signing a record deal, it means that's the doorway through which you know, you can you can step up and get your music heard at least. Uh, maybe you'll have a hit if you're lucky. Mm. But um, the thing is, when we the time we got to that point, we'd already we were already shifting records. We we had a whole underground club base, and we had about forty thousand people buying our own tunes, which we were making on our own label. Okay. So when we when we moved to Magnet, when we moved to Magnet, we were just um, coming becoming a corner shop that gets signed by a, a supermarket. You know, so that's what happened. But the, the process of signing the deal is just, you know, as as uh, um, as they say in the business, what the large print giveth, the small print taketh away. I think that's yeah. Tom Waits. Not Those aren't my words. But, yeah. you know, I, I knew I was going to get ripped off, but I, I did limit by how much I was going to get ripped off because I w did want to have my music known. And I was quite aware that a lot of people were too cool for school and they didn't. They didn't want to get involved in that kind of thing. But I knew the music business was a necessary, um, a necessary dance with the devil in order to get the music across. Mm. And I really always thought about if I'm going to do this, I want to be number one. I don't want to I don't want to be in the podium two or three or whatever it is. And I just want to be up there, you know, and that was my dream. And I did everything to get that, including keep minding my P's and Q's and being a good boy and not being too difficult and all the other stuff that goes with it. So that's that's what it was. So signing the deal was just a, a catalyst. Yeah. See, see, when you actually signed your deal, was there, how did it feel? Because mm. I remember when we signed our deal, it, mm. it felt so surreal. And then all of a sudden it felt mm. very, very real. Mm. Um, and it was like, oh my God, right. Okay. You know, mm. this is now here. There's no escaping this. So there was a little bit of trepidation as much as there was excitement. How was it for you? I do recall signing the deal um, and it was on a Friday evening and it was about seven o'clock and I'd cycled from my house in um, Labrick Grove all the way down to uh, Kensington High Street with the uh, electric you? lighting station. Yeah, <laughs> cool. I was, I cycled, they, they had on our flyers when we toured would take that. They said, uh, people, Peter recycles everything and he cycles everywhere. And, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't like that at all, but it, it's funny now I think back on it. 
so yeah, I, I got down there and I cycled and it turned up and I, you know, I just have to be careful because eventually I had to stop because I'm turning up to these meetings and I'm sweating and what have you. And it wasn't cool, <laughs> but and I someone had a word with me and I was going, uh, today I'd still do it, you know. But um <laughs> <laughs> so I got I got down there, signed the signed the deal, and the champagne was corked. And then I sat down and I had to do four hours of phoners to Australia. Oh really? On my own. Oh. Yeah. And I was there till I think three in the morning because of the time difference. Yeah, so yeah. that although it's, I did, actually I did I did shed a tear, I must say, because it was just such a hard slog getting there. And I thought this is it now, because these guys we were struggling to get to the top of the charts before we went went through Warner, and then we knew we had the backing, and then I knew it was going to be real. And true mm-hmm. enough, within within that year, we all started started gracing the the lower levels of the forty, and within a year uh, at number one. So it, it it just was the thing you have to do. Okay, we will come to that. We will come to it. Mm-hmm. So, Peter, I've asked these questions in previous interviews, so I'm I'm very interested yeah, sure. to get yeah. your take on it as, as well. So, mm-hmm. when you signed the deal, did you guys ever sit down? with record company executives, with management, and actually plan a roadmap? Or was it just the case of this is what you're going to do and you have to do it and there's no choice? Because that's very well, much how I felt. Yeah, I can I can, I can, can see that. And I know that a few people had that experience. I was a bit longer in the tooth by the time I did this. I was 24. Okay. Um, so I'd already been through the mill with my indie band. And mm-hmm. I knew what to expect. Um, we signed to Mother Records, U2's label, and all of the politics that are involved in that. So the idea was that we would license our label, which was called FXU, FXU, to Warners. So I kept our label as a subsidiary, and it gave us creative control. Got you. So when we went to the label, we knew what record we were going to release, what one we were going to film the video for, what remixes we were going to do. So we had a little bit more structure uh, and in that regard and it was much better relationship with the label however by the time we would had the number one the label wanted more and more and they just didn't want us having consult um part of the deal had a word consult in it um sorry consent okay i had consent over anything that the label would do in my deal and by the time we were number one uh just before we were going to go on tour and just before i went on stage at um uh, what's his name? I can't remember. It's a major, major sort of TV. They said, look, they want to change this to um, consult, which basically means wiping out your your control. Yeah, Otherwise, you're not going to get the tour support. And then, oh, you're on. <laughs> right. So you've got to go on, you know, put the smile on. I think uh, this is the stuff I wanted to try and prevent. But they, they do. They, they're, if business is someone over for your profit, that's what they do. And they're really good at it. That's why they have secretaries and marble floors and they make millions of it and they you know i, I know this but it's a, as i say it's a dance with the devil and mm. you know i learned bitterly that and then by the time they had they had complete control over that they started um not paying attention to what we wanted to do and starting to do what they wanted to do so that's when it really crossed over and became pop yeah you see that this it was it started to become troublesome for myself mm. because I just felt mm. totally out of control of my own destiny. And because I was given such a, an amazing opportunity, I just felt I had to be very humble, very grateful, and always mm. basically do what they told us to do. In hindsight, mm. I, I wish I was a little bit more of your thinking that I was more long in the tooth. But sometimes I wonder, it's, it's you know, when you step into that situation, you know, you're, you're working with people who have got so much more experience, particularly on our side, and you just have to trust in the process. Did you mm. trust in the process? Mm. No, I, I'm, I'm always very, um, everyone's uh, guilty until proven innocent in my book. So I didn't trust the process at all. I have to say, though, when when you're at the front, fronting the band, you are yeah. so incredibly busy and focused on all of that, that yeah. they could, they're, they're doing um, magic Wagic works behind you, pulling all chicanery and all sorts of stuff. So something would happen. I'd go, no, no, this is not what we agreed. No, that's what's happening. And you, ah, and it started to become like that. So I ended up being a pawn rather than a king. Yeah. And and, and the next thing I know, because the management tended to decide, became more and more. It sounded like the manager was just the mouthpiece, mouthpiece piece of the label rather than, my, you know, my knight in my corner. Yeah. And that that's what started to happen. And people ask me what went, it's a long story. What what went wrong? But um. 
yeah, it took it took a couple of years for that. But I, I realized I built my house on shaky ground that some of the people I had in, in the label were awful. And uh, my management, were, you know, they weren't focused as much as they could have been. They tried to expand the management company. They brought in all their artists. And then, you know, the next thing, because they're not focused on us. And they certainly weren't. Um, I think they certainly they were becoming more and more easily led by the label because of the leverage that the label has for the new artists they have on their list. You see what I'm saying here? It's yeah, like totally. They, they're totally. always doing that. It's like, oh, you know, if you if I get him to do what you want, you'll give me what I want for this other artist, artist mm. X, you know, and that's what happens. Yeah. You see, the, 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 we'll come to, I always use the word momentum, mm. and we'll come to that mm. in just a moment, Peter. It's mm. interesting what you say about being the front man of the band, um, because in, in the early days when I sort of got to know you guys, my impression of you was that you were always the face of the band, you were the front man of the band. So mm. even though you were an all-male lineup, were you comfortable with that role? And I guess more importantly, because I'm interested to know what your bandmates thought, were they comfortable with it as well? But, um, so let's be honest, do you know the way Mick Hucknall is to Simply Red? Then that yeah. is Pete Connor to Doreen. Okay. Okay. So the people okay. I had around me were, were friends and musicians. And I, even Alan, to, to an extent, was my, more my producer than more of a bandmate yeah. because he yeah. didn't play okay. an instrument. Sure. So, I, I got I got musicians around me, and I didn't want it to be the peak hunt experience. I want I wanted to be my dream, you know, that that something that under which that umbrella dream can do an awful lot of musically. We we do soul, we do funk, we do rock. We, you know, it's not that fixed on that one dance thing or the pop thing, and that's that's what it is for me. So there, they didn't really have much of a say in what was going on, to be honest. So um, you know, people would have a word with me if they thought something was like awry, but. No, it was all myself and the management that, that put all of it together. Okay. When you released, when you, sorry, you are the best thing, and it didn't quite make the top 40, first of all, were you surprised? And secondly, how did you cope with the disappointment? You are the best thing was originally released, released by um, uh, Rhythm King. Is that the one you mean? Yes. So Rhythm, Rhythm King put it out a couple of years before we ended up in Warner. And uh, uh, we, we did the whole Scottish tour. You know that thing where you go and you take a £2,000, you pay the guy and he drives you around like, and you do five nightclubs in a yes. night. Oh, we yes. did that. Yeah, oh, you know yes. that one. And you're like, <laughs> yeah. wow, I never knew this existed. Uh, and <laughs> and um, we, we left the money on the plane. I forgot oh, about no. It. <laughs> I know. I mean, how do you leave two grand on a plane? Like, anyway. Oh my god! <laughs> I know. So, um, well, we got up there. We did the work, and within like that summer, I think it could have been nineteen, mm, nineteen ninety, ninety one. Uh, yeah, we managed to get. They managed to get it to like seventy two in the British charts, with a lot of work, pluggers, everything. But you know, fast forward a, a year later, by the time we'd done the Sasha mix and we put it out on FX Your Own Label. This thing was flying, and Pete Tong essential tuned this the record two two weekends in a row. I believe yeah. it's the only record. I believe it's the only song that's ever been essential tuned two weeks in a row. I could be, you know, wrong in that. And someone should correct me. But so that that was something, you know, because the momentum and that the nightclubs we were getting on the back of that, and our, our fees quadrupled. And um, but by the time we got that in place, then then really think things started to change, you know, because then we were signing the Warner deal. Yeah, and they were gonna hit. They were gonna hit it right in the nose, and I think they got it to number nineteen, if I remember. It was our first forty, and it got as high as nineteen, and that was great to start with. Then we had um, Unforgiven. Um, I can't remember now, to be honest, what happened that year. There was four releases, and Things Are Going Better was one of them. But Things Are Going Better, the first version, didn't have that big ballad intro, and it, it didn't do so well. You know, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because it. Even though you say it didn't do too well, it's interesting because um, it, uh, I think it got to number 26 from memory. Um, it was yeah. definitely a top 30 hit. Right. Were you disappointed with that? Because I remember with our debut single, we, we got a top 20 and everyone was mm. like up in arms about it. But considering mm. the amount of plugging that had been done and the, the amount of radio work that, that we were yeah, getting yeah. From radio play, yeah. I genuinely expected it to be top 15, top 10. And when yeah. it eventually settled at number 19, I've got to be honest, mm. I was gutted. How mm. did you feel about things can only get better the first time around? Well, I thought there was work to be done. And what, what turned it around? Um, that, that positioning is basically based on chart. 
new people who are discovering you because you're on the, you're on the top of the pops and that kind of thing. And then also we had like forty thousand clubbers, God bless their, their their spandex pants, who were just in there all the time buying us in, you know, and we could rely on them. But what did what switched it for us is we went on tour with Take That at the, yeah. by the end of that year. Yeah. Now that meant we went to see like we went from like I don't know how many, but like 30,000 30, Take That fans, and and um, was it even more? Could have been more over the period of like like um like a month or so saw us, and we started getting teddy bears in the office, and I was going, this is really weird. Um, you know, I'm a 25 year old man at this stage. <laughs> what are we going to do with all these teddy bears? And then I just realized that once they were coming up, then to do the real release, that was the January of 20, 1994. Oh, yeah, there was there was already a swell there. So there's like pop kids who were into it, our clubbers. The combination of that, we just straight in at number one for six weeks, five four weeks, and it was it gone from like um like eighty thousand sales. We went up to four hundred and 450,000 you know sales and it, it peaked at 600,000 sales so you could just see that the take that term made the biggest difference to us it, it, um you see going on take that the, the tour for me was a genius move I remember at the time that you were doing it and it was a genius move to do it um because all of a sudden you've got momentum because of their fan base but what I'm interested yeah. to know about the take that tour Peter is did you tailor your own performances to suit that market, or did you just remain who D Ream were and the, the DNA of D Ream? Did that no, stay? No, there's, there's youngsters in the audience. So we, you know, I just I I I first of all stopped cursing. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you know, I just out of respect. <laughs> but um <laughs> so but the thing is like you you've got half an hour, so you get on and you thank take that for having you. And yeah. um that they're, they're really good because they're there from seven o'clock, so they're gonna give you it's their first concert. Some of these boys and girls, many girls, and so you just do your thing. And I, I just, I got, I got, I've never been on a stage before at that level. And I thought I can do this because, like, I wanted my band to be Stadium House. Um, in fact, I still do because we've got, we've got the uh, anthems. And I was just like, I was just reaching out. I was just working an audience in a brand new way, trying to get the band to fill the stage because I really worked hard. I made sure I made eye contact with everybody. I got them going at the right moments and they went away with a great impression of us, you know? Mm. So I did tailor it a bit. Yeah. But I also was learning as well. Okay. What did you learn? Stagecraft, I suppose. I mean, on, it's on a bigger scale. So, you know, you've got 10,000 people in the middle and you've got two there and two in the wings, but don't neglect anybody. And, um, you know, say to some of the members of the band, if I'm over here, you can sort of wave over at people over there make sure that they feel like, you know, we were feeling it you know it's, yeah. it's such it's such a joy joyous thing to do and to have people singing your your music you know not, not at that stage at the time we did the second tour they were they were singing our our music it's brilliant who took the decision actually to re-release the record after take that the tour was that your decision or was that, that, that a combination was, that, that was our management and us and we knew that it's funny isn't it that it just shows you we re-released all of them and it, it, it's yeah. the, it, once you've got the audience reach, it gets heard again. It gets heard in a new light. Now, don't forget, that took three years to get people to know that's that fella. There's the name of the band, and that's the songs he sings. Yeah, right. So if you if you look at TV and advertising, it's quite easy to see that you know this is Lenore. <laughs> you all know what Lenore is, and you know the ads. And that's what, it takes a long time to get people's attention. It and then and behind that, it takes a long time um, for them to actually do something about that attention you've got. Mm. You know, so act mm. on it, and that's that's what we were we we're getting that kind of traction. And the, oh, although we went, although we went to the lower, uh, we we crossed over and we 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 were up there. We did not go stratospheric. We didn't go to stadium levels on our own right. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. My label were con concerned about just plugging me to like little tiny shows, and we got with the wrong agents. We were speaking to the wrong people in America, and it it, it never clicked. These things never clicked. I, I still sense a, a touch of frustration from you about that. Do you have frustration? No, no. Listen, I, I think about it sometimes and I kick myself about it sometimes. But listen, you know, I, I, those are the cards I've been dealt. That's how the cookie crumbled. And I have to live with that. Yeah. You know, okay. um, we're still we're on album five now, me and Al. Mm. And we're we're musically at our best place. We're doing festivals all of this summer. And we've got a live tour lined up in September. It could not be better. Yeah. Um, this time we're where we are our own um we're our own masters there's no management company interfering with things we're just working with live agents and our own musicians and the fans and that's and they're really 
they're re- excuse me they're really dedicated i just thought i went on silent mode i hate these computers they decide to switch off <laughs> don't worry uh, do, so do hear you and see just okay, perfectly like, okay well it's just like it's one of those things you know i i i, I spent many years not being peaked from dream i went and had a family i had a life and then I thought, you know what, what's the point? Like, if I'm not doing my art, then what am I doing? What am I here for? So yeah. once I'd finished, um, you know, bringing up my, my two my two little ones, um, I got to a stage where I started thinking about music again. And then I bumped into a by complete fluke at the, um, in, a, in the park at the back of my our family home. And we got chatting. It was like one of those things, if, if you put the lawyers to get us back together, it would never have happened because we parted on such bad terms. But when I saw him in the park... I just went over and he's we just face to face. He saw this. Says, you know, what happened to you? I was going, well, what happened to you? And he's going, well, you know, life and what do you want to do? He said, you shouldn't have done that second record without me. It was shit. <laughs> and I know I said, uh, well, with the benefit of hindsight, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it didn't have him in it. He says, yeah. well, do you want to do another one? I said, all right. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. I know but it's that I, simple. I do want to talk about what you're doing now in. in, yep. in just a moment but what i'm really interested to know is because I, I like to talk about fame the sort of the implications of it is it all necessary mm. all that sort of stuff so when you have this global hit and it was a global hit peter um mm. did you notice a sizable shift in your own fame yeah yeah it, I, I really struggled dealing with that um you know, kids that would never even look at you as you go down the street are now asking you for an ice cream and some of them are planting themselves on the wall until you show up. And then it gets a bit awkward because then the, the teenagers show up and you, you go outside and, you know, I'm a grown man. I'm going like, I'll respect. I went to these girls. I said, listen, I know you're going to hang out here all summer, but I, I'd really respect you more if you go off and have a great time and go and hang out with your mates and meet yeah. a nice young fella. Yeah. And, um, and you know what? Come back to me at the end of the summer. See how you feel. No one came back. Really? It's great. No, but yeah. why? It's, I was just encouraging them to go and live their life. It's standing out here is not going to do anything. You know, I'm, I'm like I'm like 10 years older than them or, or even not. It's just kids, the way they throw themselves at these things, I think it's quite um, soul-destroying, really, because I, I, I don't think they know what they want to do. They just want they want to be close to that fame, you know? Yeah. yeah. You see, I've it, what I struggled with was, you know, I, I, I'm don't get me wrong, I'm not very comfortable with it, and I, I'm extremely mm. grateful for it, and I don't ever want to try and sound like I'm not grateful for what happened, because I am, mm. and I'm quite humbled by it. But at the time, it did used to trouble me. Mm. And it used to trouble me when girls would come over and they would say to me, I love you, I, I just mm. love you. And I'm like, mm. you don't, you, you really don't. don't. No. Because what you're in love with is you're in love with an image. That image, that's it. Think. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you don't know me as a person, you don't know my, you know what you see is a character and an image which is portrayed in yep. magazines and yeah we know, you know that one yep yep yeah absolutely but yeah. you can't but i i felt i can't say this to them because if i say this to them i'll absolutely shatter them and i didn't yeah. ever want to do that no, what no i did what i did do peter was i did used to say to to fans please don't come to my house it's the only thing i ask of mm. you do not come to my house and i have to say mm. apart mm. from one or two they mm. respected that because i wanted my own time and my own privacy um mm. so there's, there's there's it sort of swings and roundabouts isn't it um mm. that's why it i was interested in how you coped with it well you just get on with it you don't cope with it you don't you're not trained how to cope with it you just exactly. it's you the human yeah. being in that scenario and uh, yeah. it's overwhelming it's overwhelming sometimes you're not you know you know i you know i wipe my own arse just like every other human being and and the way some people were treating you uh, is like a god now some people that goes to their head personally that's not for me and also i found fame very hard to deal with because i did i did i only knew how much i found valued my anonymity till after that had happened and i got i just basically i said no to everything for about a decade so yeah. i didn't go on um pop star to opera star i didn't go on any of these things uh, or the jungle or any of that crap i just literally just had me and my family and i did the odd gig with some friends and family and that was it you know job done and, mm. and I stayed away from it and I got back my anonymity. I got back my uh, humanity as well because you lose yourself in that place, man. You really can lose yourself. I think it's a p- great place for psychopaths because they love it. Um, blimey, I find it. I find like I felt like I've been through the mangle. You see, really this, did. this is what's really interesting now, Peter, is because yeah. you're now having another crack at this and you know, you're, you're, 
you're going to start releasing stuff again. So is the reasoning for doing it now different than what it was, say, 30 years ago? And are you, do you think you're now more prepared as a human being to be able Absolutely. to do the game side of it? That's not... It, it's as unlikely as, as it is to happen. We are, as I said, our masters of what we're doing. So we're running things at our own pace, you know, and this this is why we're actually on. This is our third album since we got back together in, in 2010 that we're working on now. And we're really proud of the music we're making and the people are loving what we're doing. And then we're going to do the, these at, the, at our gigs and our live shows. I don't want to do any more than that. I, I, I'm not sure how it would work because you'd have to go back to getting into bed with major labels. Now, there, some major labels are better than others, mm. right? You know, the likes mm. of... Um, uh, maybe Island or that kind of thing, or XL, they seem to have a good environment for, for artists to thrive within. But the bigger ones, the, the monsters, chew, chew and spit out, that's that's their that's their modus operandi. And I wouldn't go into the same bear cave twice, if you were with me. So if it happened, fine. We're, are we looking? No, we're not. Because we've got, we've got the circle. We've, we're earning a living out of this, and, and then some. And we're also happy doing what we're doing. So it's it's got a pace and a, a size. We want to grow it, obviously. We want to do more gigs. They were talking about getting us into Glastonbury this year in one of the tents. And I think we're on the standby list, which is, you know, how salubrious is that? But if it doesn't happen this year, it might be next year because that's 30 years now. As next year, this yeah. January, 30 years ago, we would had our number one. So maybe yeah. something will happen next summer. I don't know. But okay. yeah, I'm from Valencia. Um, where where else are we? Done Ireland, we've got, We're all over the gaff. You know, it's great, really mm. great, keeping us busy. You see, again, it it really intrigues me because sort of second time mm. around, you, you you know, you've had the experience once, and I remember, I can still recall to this day because when we when we caught up the other day to to discuss that we were going to do this, sort of memories mm. came flooding back, and I remember that we did the Radio One Roadshow together, and mm. we were in the hotel and we were in the foyer. And you and I were coming down the stairs to get into, I think it was a, a minivan or something. They were taking us all to the gig at the same time. We I just well remembered. Wow. We had, we had just flown in from yeah. Spain or something like that. I was knackered. Yeah. I was just exhausted. And a guy said to me, one of the roadies said to me, you know, how you doing? I said to him, I'm, I'm just knackered, mate. I'm absolutely knackered. I says, we're flying here left, right and centre. And he, and he proceeded to take the mick because he was like, oh, you know, you pop stars, you don't know how good you've got it and all that sort of stuff. But these guys don't actually understand that this is it is absolutely mm. exhausting. But I felt guilty for saying that I felt exhausted because mm. the image that is being portrayed of us is nothing what people actually see. And I That's remember it. you saying to us, yeah. I'm just shattered. Is this where this burnout came from, Peter? Mm. Where did the burnout come from? Um and why did you decide? Oh, yeah, no, it built. It builds up. It builds up for a, a long while. After we did the second album with Warner's, I think it was I, I done a, a UK live tour, which I very much enjoyed. But the sales were different after Shoot Me With Your Love, and they, they changed the formulas at the record label as in how much they're going to promote with you. And I, I put my hand in my pocket a few times to pay for some videos like um, Party Up The World, which is filmed at Jod World Bank with Brian and everyone. And... um. I could kind of, I got into a bit of a head to head. I locked horns with a guy called Mark Dean at Magnet, who was who was parachuted in to um, take over from another guy who was a music executive. But Mark Dean had previous with my manager. They got into a fight. I mean, a physical fight. I was caught in the middle, and the whole thing was just like it, this guy. It was a fight for control. Mm. And um, I, you know what? I just went in one day. I said, you know what? I'm not making an, another record for this company. I can't be involved with you guys. It's just not a good. It's not a good place. You are toxic, right? And I walked out. I just walked out, and that was it. And I spent a couple of years then lawyers and all the rest of it, just trying to get out of that deal. In fact, the guy that got me out was a fella called um, uh, a Jazz Summers from Big Life. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Jazz was really good at getting me out of there. But Jazz persuaded me to do the labor thing. So. That was kind of a, uh, yeah, out of, the frying, out of the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see, I, I, again, I remember having a conversation with you uh -huh. about 
hit records and momentum. And, you know, we had just yeah. had our first top 10 hit and it was all about momentum. Mm. Yeah. And saying to me, they want another, they want me to pen another hit. Um, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I remember you saying to me, I, how, how do I do this? So what yeah. I'm interested in now is yeah. if, if you could have another hit, like things can only get better. Yeah. Do you have to still now, knowing what happened to you before, do you have to take into consideration the fear of burnout again? No, I wouldn't. Um, it, you know, there's a reason why they only recruit 18 year olds to fight in wars because they'll take orders. But I'm 56. So if you start barking around at me, I'll be like, you know, saunter on. Yeah, <laughs> it's not going to happen. But the thing is, I have got the songs now. Um, and I I'm, and they asked me to rewrite things going to get better. And I've seen I've watched Max Martin do the same for Baby one more time. Mm. And then whoops, I did it again. Those are carbon copies. So he, he he worked the formula of himself. I just thought that was disingenuous. I wouldn't do that. Having thought back, back, maybe it's the thing I should have done. But I don't know where these things come from, Ali. They just I come in and I write and I have these ideas and they're unique and I, I play around with them and I do all of that stuff to get it to, to make it, first of all, excite my imagination before it excites anyone else's if it's got the vibe then it's great but um yeah i've got the songs there and i'm really enjoying that process but if you start trying to tell me to go over the you know and do this do that and everything no you, I've, i'm a very different animal yeah. i'd be too difficult to be on a major label okay. <laughs> okay, we've got two minutes left and i've got one last uh -huh. question okay, go one on. last question. Go on. okay if you could have your time again and if you mm -hmm. could change any decision or yeah. anything that happened during yeah. the first round of DREAM, what would you change? It can be anything, Peter. Signing to a major. Okay. We had we had deals on the table with uh, independents who were backed by majors, so we should have just licensed our little label onto someone that was something like an XL that would have that would have grown with us as partners, as opposed to the monster that needs to be fed by a feast. Yeah. Mm. They, they would have gone more with the development. That was a mistake. We went for the big money and the, the whole blast, and that was it. Once you're done, and if you hadn't stuck on the stratosphere, they were done with you. So that's what I'd have done. I wouldn't have gone with a major. I'd have signed to an independent independent publisher and an independent um, label, you know. that's. But, hey, the milk is spilt. Yeah. Are I'm you happy? Crying over it. Are you happy? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't get any better than this for me. I have a fantastic home overlooking a... A lake out here. I'm married again. Uh, yeah. I still speak to my children. I'm looking after my father. I go up and check in on him every day. He's in his um, late 80s now. I have a great relationship with my kids. Uh, really incredible how we've developed with myself and Alan uh, in terms of our writing and our musicianship. And in fact, I'm looking forward to these tour, this tour in September and um, all these dates are coming up. I think I Next date is in April, and we're both in Stirling and in Newcastle on the same day. And, you know, life is sweet, man. I'm, I'm good. I've got money. I've got everything a boy could ask for. Brilliant. Fantastic. Mate, listen, thank you so much no for jumping on. No it's problem. been absolutely yeah. brilliant catching up with you. Yeah. And I wish you nothing but every success going forward, particularly with the new material. Um, Thanks, so, mate, thank you. It's lovely to see you. No worries. Pleasure. And the same for you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. My thanks to D Reams frontman Peter Cunner. I really hope you enjoyed today's watch. And if you did, I'd be very grateful if you would please consider subscribing to the Accidental Pop Star here on YouTube. Doesn't cost anything. All it means is that we just build the channel and bring you more interviews going forward. We are all done. Thanks so much for watching. And I'll see you again for a brand new episode of the Accidental Pop Star. Bye for now.